video tutorial on functions part two. If you haven't watched part one, you might want to jump back and watch part one now because we're going to pick up uh, sort of where we left off and things are going to get complicated pretty quick. All right, this is part of Statistics 321 at Virginia Commonwealth University, but anybody's free to use it. Okay, so here's a more complicated function than we had before. If you remember before, we had a simple uh, polynomial. It was a cubic. Um, here, while this is still a polynomial, it's bounded between 0 and 1. And, and this is the key, is, is now we need to put in more statements into our function in order to get it to do the right thing. Because really what we want it to do is, if it's outside of our bounds, we want it to return the value 0. Uh, and this is quite common if you're dealing with probability distributions, and that's why I'm assigning it to 0, is if you're outside of the domain, assign it to zero. So we're going to have to put logic in our function, and we would probably also like to put the plot in the function maybe if we wanted to. But first let's jump over to R and put this in there, and we're going to have to pay attention to things because things are going to get complicated pretty quick. We've jumped over to R, and now let's start putting this crazy function in there. Okay, so I have my basic format for a function here. Just as a reminder, uh, after a while, we'll quit putting this up here. But since we're just starting to learn about functions, we'll leave it up here for now. So uh, what I want to call this function is, um, how about fun2? For function2. Um, and it's lots of fun as well. So we're going to use the, the word keyword function. And we're going to have to put in a value, and this only had a value x involved, so we don't need to make this very complicated. Uh, we do need the return uh, or the close uh, brace on this in order for this to work. I like to actually define what my output's going to be, and I usually call it res1, uh, just because that's what I do. Uh, it's my habit. That way I know it's the result, and if I have multiple results, which we'll learn how to do in another fun, uh, video, uh, it might have res1, res2, whatever, whatever in it. So anyway, uh, I'm going to define it as res1. I need to pay attention here. The function that I want to do is, uh, I'm just going to call it res1 right now. If we remember, it was x squared times 1 minus x to the fourth. Now, this is all well and good, but I need my function to check if I'm putting in a number that's negative, less than zero, or a number that's bigger than one, because either of these aren't going to work in this function the way we've defined it. We've defined the function to have bounds. So in order to do this, we're going to have to put in an if statement. So we'll do if our x that we're interested in is... Let's see here, less than zero. Uh, we'll put here greater than zero. Actually, let's do less than zero. Or, well, we can't do or, so it's the bar here. That's our or, We've gotta remember that. X is greater than one. Then we'll do something. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna put it else on here, do something else. And this else is actually calculate the value. Okay, and now this is almost going to work. We're just going to make res1 equal to uh, 0. Okay, so this seems as though this might work. So uh, we're going to put in a number x. It's going to see if x is negative or if x is greater than 1. And if it is, then just give it the value 0. And otherwise, it will calculate the actual value that we wanted. Uh, so let's give this a go and see if this works. So the first thing we got to do is actually run the function. Just because we've typed it into the editor, R doesn't see it. And the way we know R doesn't see it is it's not over here in our environment. It says the environment is empty. So we're going to run this function. So we ran it. Fun2 exists in here. And uh, that becomes easy. And if we wanted to, we could actually run it down here. So fun to, and I'm just going to put in the number five. Now, I know that this should give me the value zero. Why? Because it's bigger than one. So if it doesn't return a zero, we know we did it wrong. So let's plug this in. And sure enough, we get a value zero. Let's plug in a number that's negative. Make sure that that works. And this is something you should do when you create functions, is test them. See if they're producing what you think they should produce. So if I plug in a negative 1 in here, I get a 0. That's good. That's what I'm supposed to get. 
So fun to, and then let's put in a number that's in the middle between zero and one. How about a half? Um, and give this a run. And sure enough, it calculates a number that's not zero. And if we wanted to, we could actually calculate this. Down here, I'll do it real quick. 0 0.5. And we had squared times, well, 1 minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. Again, that's why I picked it, to the fourth. And I get the exact same number. So I know it's calculating the correct number. So this is all well and good. Now what happens if I want to see a sequence of these? Remember, maybe I want to plot it. So I'm going to create a sequence, and I'm going to call it x1. It's going to be my sequence. And it's going to go between, I'm going to have it go between negative 1 and 2. And I'm going to go by, if I can type, I can't type. Uh, I'm assuming most of you are the same way. Uh, 0 0.1. And we're going to run this, make sure it shows up over here in our environment. Sure enough, it does. And now we're going to plug this into our function. So let's do fun2 x1. Let's see what happens. And it all of a sudden screams at us. And the reason is, is our if statement, I'm going to scroll up here. So just forgive me if you haven't caught up on the typing. Uh, we'll come back down to it. The problem is, is this is looking at a single value. And what I've done here is I've put in actually 300 values into this thing, or actually 301. So it doesn't know what to do, and it doesn't know how to handle them. So we need to actually handle each one of these individually. Uh, of course, there's a better way to do this, and we're not going to talk about that. But what I'm trying to do is show you how we're going to chain ideas together. So we have an if-else function. But the other thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to loop through each value in x. So we're going to have to add a loop to our function. So let's just take this function. We're going to copy and paste it. I'm going to scroll down here and try to leave a little space for you, those of you who haven't caught up on this part. So you can t finish typing that in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this function 3. Okay. And I'm going to modify this function because I need to do this in a loop. Okay, So I'm expecting a loop to come through. So x is gonna, now a vector, so it's going to have an index. So what we're going to do is uh, create a for loop, i in 1, 2, oh, we've got to figure out how far to go. That's problem number one. Uh, and then we have to realize we have an index. And so I'm going to put this, close this off. I'm actually going to highlight this. And in our studio, if I hit tab, it'll move it in. And the only reason I indent like this, uh, if you're a Python programmer, you, you know it, it's nice to indent or you're forced to indent. Here, we're not forced to indent, but it makes it easier to see. Okay, so this is where it started, come straight down. This is where it ended. This is where the if started, and this is where it ended. So the indenting make th makes things nice uh, to read the function later. Do you have to do it? Absolutely not, uh, unless you work in a place that makes you do it, uh, and that's fine. So what we're, I'm going to do here is I got to figure out how far to go. So I'm going to make n1 equal to the length assuming that this is a vector of x. So it's going to take and find the vector of x, and it's going to say how many x's are there, and it's going to store it here. Then when I do my loop, I'm going to run through every single one of those. That will be n1. Okay, That's going to run it from 1. Here's our 1, and it's going to go all the way to the end or the length of x. Now, the problem is, is that we need res1 to actually be a vector to come out as well. So we need to make this a container instead. Okay, so we're going to make res1 now. We're going to repeat a 0, and we're going to do it n1 times. So this is going to give me a vector of zeros. It's going to have 300 spots or 301 spots for each one of my result numbers. And then I can just plug them in. All right, so this is all well and good, but now I have to index through each of the x's, okay? So I have to say, okay, I'm at the, if i is equal to 5, I'm at the fifth x. Go to x, grab the fifth one, okay? And then I need to store this in the ith place in my container, res1. And what this does is this will store it in my container, but I need to put in here an i as well. So it's still working on the same i or x that I started with. Okay, so this is what I mean. Things were going to get complicated rather quick. 
Uh, I'm going to scroll this up a little bit so you can see the whole function. And I'll probably move my console down just a little bit. Okay, so let's go back through the function. This is function three, or fun three, because we're having great fun. Three times the fun, maybe. Uh, here we have x is what we're putting in. The first thing we're going to do is we are going to determine how long x is. Uh, determine length of x. Okay, and this is where commenting comes in. Create. Okay, then create a container to hold results. Okay, then I'm going to come over here. Loop through all x's. Okay, that's what that's going to do. And this does the if statement. Put in here uh, logic to determine bounds. Here, put if uh, we are out of bounds. Here, this is else. Uh, if that's not true, then do this. Then actually calculate the function. And down here, return the results. Now, I know this is a lot to keep in track of, so you might want to comment on why this function has uh, x with brace i, and the function above does not. Also, we don't need the brace i up here or the brace i here because we're outside of the loop. R still sees it as a vector, but when we start processing each one, it needs to go to each element and do the processing on each and every individual element. All right, so let's run this function so that it compiles. It shows up over here in our list or our, our environment so that we can work with it. So let's give this a go. So here is fun three, and then I'm here I have x1. If you remember, x1 is a sequence, and I'm going to run this and just see if it blows up. And sure enough, I get values, uh, which is great, but I would probably like to actually plot these values. So I'm going to make this y1. That way I can just do a simple plot of this thing. Uh, we won't do doctor it up too much because the video is already running long. But let's just plot this thing, plot x1, because that's what we put into our function, y1. And we'll make the type equals L, and we'll leave it black for the moment. Okay, so when I run this, I should get a picture of our function. So if I zoom in, this is what our function looks like. It's zero until zero. And after one, it's zero, but it has this skewed right shape between zero and one. And that's the great thing about R is it allows us to create functions where we can put these bounds in it, and the bounds are controlled by if statements. But in order to go through each and every value, we had to use a for loop. And what I'm trying to show you here is, is when you're computing, often you have to chain ideas together. It's not just as simple as, oh yeah, I can just throw it in there and it's going to work. Um, I have lots of students who go, oh, well, uh, it should work. Don't think that it should work. Uh, there are ways to force it to work, and you know that these are good programming techniques because they actually do work consistently every time. Uh, there are some ways you can vectorize things in R to make them run faster and do things, do the same sort of thing. But I'm not going to talk about those for many reasons because I purposely want to show you how to use a loop and an if statement again because that's part of this is learning computing and for loops and if statements are and functions are basic tools for computing. So I'm hoping that you'll get used to them. All right, so I know this video has ran long, but it's time to move on to the next video.